do you think I'm a rebound? We're like, no, Alex. I would never have called you a car to the first date because there's a lot of guys out there that'll do that. And you can go date one of them. But I am not setting the precedent out of the gates that I'm that guy. How does it feel divorcing someone that comes from generational wealth to now dating a popcorn salesman? You told me this. My past is a really important part of who I am today. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode two of Just Alex. You guys... Thank you for your response to episode one. That episode for me was so vulnerable and emotional. It took it out of me. I cried before it. I didn't really cry after it. I was kind of numb after it. But your responses meant the world to me. I hate that some of you DM me and you're like, I know the pain you went through because I don't want anyone to know the pain of divorce or separation or loss. But the way of the world is some of us just know it. And so... We're better because of it. That's the theme that I heard from everyone was like, I made it through. I'm like you. I'm thankful to be on the other side. So if you're going through it, keep the positive mentality. Um, but I'm happy that I shared that story with you. I'm so deeply thankful for your responses. And if you haven't listened to that episode, it's episode one. This is episode two. So go back and listen to it. And today, oh, you guys, subscribe. It's so important. Go, you can go on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple and just press that little subscribe button, leave me a review if you want, but all that means, it really does mean the world. So without further ado, today's episode is one that I'm so excited about because I get to sit on a couch and chat with my boyfriend Harrison. You guys get to meet him. He's here with me now. Hello. Hello, hello. How do you feel today being here? I feel good. I think like we've talked about this for a while. About you coming on? Yeah. Yeah, we have talked about it for a while, and this is perfect. Like, today's the great day to have you on, episode two. I'm excited to introduce you to the people, but let's hear it from the word, no, from the horse of the mouth. Is that right? From the mouth of the horse. Yeah, hear it from the horse's mouth. The horse's mouth. So give us the 30-second elevator pitch on who you are. Well, I'm Harrison. <laughs> for starters. Uh, from Vancouver, Canada, born and raised. Went to school at McGill University up in Montreal. Graduated school, knew I wanted to live in one of the major metropolitan cities of the world. To me, that was really London or New York. Wasn't sure how to get there. The research I did made it seem like the two cleanest options were either finance or law school. Hated school, so opted for finance. Ended up getting a job at a big bank and then worked with that bank for seven years where I got to see the world, starting my career in New York for a few years before moving to Hong Kong for a few years and then wrapping up my banking career in San Francisco. And then I left the finance industry and, and started my own business in the food and beverage world uh, where we, we make snacks. So I started a company called The Naked Market we own and operate a few different brands. One of them is called Flock Chicken Skins. Uh, it's, a, it's a line of, of different chicken snacks. Uh, we have a, a brand called Rob's Backstage Popcorn, which we created with the Jonas Brothers and, and some other amazing, amazing partners. Our company headquarters is, is based in LA, where uh, I spent the past year and a half plus living. And here we are today. <laughs> I also lived in Hong Kong and then San Francisco. I'm just kidding. I couldn't pick Hong Kong out on a map, but I'm so excited for when you take me and show me the ropes. What do you think it's close to? I think it's, I mean, I know it's over in Asia on the top right side, right? Yeah, that, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, I know exactly where it's at. That's um, way better than I would have thought you would have gotten. I just said I can't pick it out on a map, and then I say I know it's exactly where it's at. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know much about it, but it's fascinating to me. Like me moving to New York, daunting and eye-opening, right? And I love it. Moving to Hong Kong, I could do London, right? I, Hong Kong, I have so much admiration for you for being able to move there for multiple years and live there and bank there and be so far away from home. Like, cool. That's so cool to me. Looking, looking back on it, I, I'd never been before, uh, before I decided to move there and before I actually got there. So I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And, and if I put like my mid-20s or early-20s thought, 
thought process on, it was like I'd been living in New York and I just wanted a new adventure and I'd been reading like Asia is a high growth part of the world and all right, I guess there's, there's this expat community that exists in Hong Kong, like I'm going to go there. And I remember when I showed up, uh, day one, I was just like, holy shit, where am I? And like, I got the language that they spoke wrong. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> so, so I was like, I'm going to move there and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn, learn Mandarin. And, and yeah, they speak Cantonese there. They speak <laughs> a different language in China than they do Hong Kong. And that what a great way to introduce myself to, to right. the viewership than, than that. But yeah, like so. Uh, and it ended up being you know, some of the best years of my life. The friends I made there are some of my closest friends to... Uh, to to this day, somehow your social presence has has made its way to Hong Kong. As as uh, the cameos I make in your videos are are still consistently forwarded to me from uh, from the fellas out there. I'm sure they're having a listen to this and and a good little chuckle. Uh, but uh, amazing place and and love going back and and uh, was was a really fun time. Uh, yeah, I. I Again, fa just fascination from me with you on that. So I've said some tidbits on how Harrison and I met, but let's let's give it a little once over really quickly, okay? So he, he nods. So we were set up by a mutual friend. And we were thrown in a group text together. And I ditched the first date. I texted Harrison and I was like, I'm, I texted you. Oh, I'm sorry about that. But I texted him the day of the day. He lives in LA. I live in New York. He was in town, not for the date, but he was in town. And I texted him and I said, I'm so sorry. I can't make it. It was a little longer than that. And his response back wasn't let's reschedule. It was just like, it's all good. I totally understand. You must have a lot on your plate. And every day after that, he entered my head like I was like, man, I should have gone on that date. I, I would love to go on a date with him. I loved that you weren't like you didn't text me two days later and say, hey, can we reschedule? You didn't come after me. Because at that point, when someone cancels, my mindset is very much so there may have been you know, interest there, but you can't fight timing. And so when you canceled, particularly canceling the way you did, the ball was was completely in your court. To, to keep things moving. So to keep things moving as one does, I heard he was back in town a few weeks later, ran into the mutual friend. She's like, I was just with Harrison. I was like, boom, perfect. So I texted Harrison and I was like, dang, too bad we couldn't have hung out tonight. Too bad our paths didn't cross or something. And say it was a flirty text message. It was, and then I posted a selfie that night on my Insta story and I shadow tagged him just to let him know. He didn't respond. Didn't I even was leave. very confused by the shadow tag. I didn't know if it was a mistake. I didn't. I didn't know if you were like doing it for views. I was like looking to see like what was happening. So I didn't even interpret that in the flirtatious way that it was that it was intended. Luckily, your texts were forward enough that that d to give me the clue. Yeah, he didn't even like the photo. You, it just was left on red, and I was like, oh, tough. But we were texting. So then uh, the next week rolls around. So Harrison's in LA, I'm in New York, and I pop up an Insta story, should I go to London or Paris? Because I was going to take my single Alex trip. Harrison DMs me, and he's like, go to Paris. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. And me being the genius that I am, I responded back, and I was like, have you been? And he's like, yeah, that's how it's one of my favorite cities in the world. And I was like, cool, well, what should I do? Oh, no, that's what happened. So I say, Paris, a fall on a sword for it. You, and then we go back and forth and you're debating Paris versus London. Mm -hmm. And then you, uh, you, send me the pic you send me a picture of your plane ticket. And I'm like, oh, shit. And I felt an element of responsibility that I forced you to it. So that's why I typed up the itinerary. That's why. So when I'm in when I'm in Paris, I we had like an excuse to text each other because I was doing everything on the itinerary. But he told me to go to this museum 
And I just like mapped the museum and it was like 10 minutes from my hotel, walked by the museum, took a photo of it and texted it to him. I didn't go in the museum because I'm not really the museum going gal. <laughs> so I was like. <laughs> I think I like told you about the cafe in the museum. <laughs> I, I did do sort of everything on the list, but I, I just wanted to keep talking to The you. Alex version. Yeah, I'm like, I'm, I was like, great museum. Just a photo of the outside. Made a loop around it, walked back. The architecture of it's cool. It's the Pompidou. Yeah, it was, it was sick. Um, and it was just close enough that I could make it in a 20-minute lap. So we text while I'm in Paris. And then the next week, I'm back in New York. Harrison's in L.A. I'm sitting in my lawyer's office. And get, my phone starts ringing. And I was like, ooh, and it was Harrison calling. And I had butterflies. And I was excited that he was calling because I thought perhaps he's coming to New York. Probably not calling to chat. And so we play phone tag a little and then I call him back that night. And he, I remember you said you were like, Alex Bennett, I'm coming to New York. If you're free Saturday night, let's go on a dinner date. And I was like, you know what, I am free. And we sat there and we chatted back and forth. And then I FaceTimed you. And we FaceTimed for four hours. And I peed on the call. Never forget it. And he, you were just like, are you peeing? Still to this day, I pee with the door open. Harrison closes it every time. And I'm not, As you should. I just, that's just not really my style. And so I, I remember on the FaceTime, though, thinking if we can talk for four hours, I would love to go on a date with this guy. So that was a good solidifier. And then yeah, and 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 I think it was it was one of those things where, you know, the the texting communication was awesome, the banter was awesome, and and then that that four hour call really showed, hey, there's something there's something special here, and you know, let's let's see what exists in in person. So he wasn't he hadn't booked his flight yet. He wasn't really coming. He just looked at his calendar. I find this out later. You. He had looked at his calendar and was like, well, if it's not now, it's never. Well, I felt like there was momentum in the relationship. And as you say. You can't buy momentum. Boom. And so, but yeah, if it wasn't that weekend, when was it going to be? And. But little nugget that I later find out is Harrison has a date in L.A. on Saturday with someone who is, he says, more well-known than you, Alex. And I say, not hard to do, Harrison, because I'm not that well-known. Later find out it's Kristen Cavallari. No, it was not. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> he won't tell us who it is. Just drop the name. Not a chance. Okay, well, his best friend, also named Alex, who's the best, says to him, dude, don't ditch your date in L.A. for Alex in New York who's already ditched you on a date, which is really good advice from a best friend. But thank God Harrison didn't take it. Flies in Saturday morning, takes me on a date that night. It lasts 36 hours. And it is the best date of my life. So we go Saturday night, Monday morning. I'm like, yo, I gotta go to work. He's like, same. So the date ends. And from there, we were off to the races. And we hung out every night that week, and um, and then we uh, on Friday we we had to both leave town as you had a work thing in Miami, and I had, I had one in Vancouver. And the timing of when we'd see each other again was still was still up in the air, and because um, I had another work trip in in Bentonville, Arkansas, on the Tuesday to to deal with some Walmart stuff, and and I remember on. I got back to Vancouver, we're talking nonstop, and I rebooked, I booked my flight back to New York on Monday just so we could have dinner Monday night. Um, as, you know, even a few hours was, 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 worth, was worth the time. Yeah, we broke, and we kept saying it, we broke every rule in our rule book, dating each other, just like, I know better than to go this fast, to, to show my cards, but... I gave an inch, he gave an inch, I gave an inch, she gave an inch, which encouraged us both to keep giving inches. But yeah, there was no games played, but it was like, boom, we do know better than this. So about two weeks into us seeing each other, I had to go back to Oklahoma City for a funeral. And you said, okay, great. I, I have my hotel here. I'll go stay in my hotel. And I was like, whoa, 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 no. You're staying here in my apartment. 
And I remember you said, no, I know better than that. And I was like, I also know better than that. And I gave you a key. And I was like, I want my apartment to feel like your apartment. Two weeks in, I think I'm crazy. Let me, let me just get ahead of all of that, right? Everyone's like, she's crazy. I think I'm crazy. You can't make the joke if I make it first. And that was when we pseudo moved in with each other. Since then, I think we've been apart two, maybe three times. I went home for Thanksgiving, didn't go home for Christmas. And I, that's because I didn't want to be apart from you. And so that's just a little snapshot of how fast things moved. Yeah. And I think when, when you tell these stories aloud, and obviously we sound super crazy, but, but what becomes really obvious is just how many big moves were made early on because of the, the mutual conviction that, that we had in, 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 the, in the relationship. And, and on that note, what, why do you think the relationship moved as fast as it did? And do you think I'm a rebound? Wow. 12 minutes in and he's like, here's a question for you. So I think it was able to move as fast as it did because of the perspective I had. And you had. We haven't gotten into your dating history. You weren't married before, but you were dating a girl very seriously for six years. And with that, I think you gain a lot of experience on what works and what doesn't. If I think you're a rebound or not, absolutely not. Because I didn't want to re. I wanted to get off the court. I didn't know where I would end up in two to three years, but I didn't care. I didn't have pressure on myself where I needed to go find somebody. I needed to get married and have kids. Like all of that had really gone out the door for me and what I thought my life would look like, I had just completely rearranged. And I was at total peace with that. And so when I met you, I was in the point in my life where it was like, all right, Alex, let's get to know Alex without anybody. Let's make that really happy. And I was in a really happy place. And then I met you and I don't think you get to mess with timing. Don't block your blessings. And so you were a natural fit into my life, but I was by no means looking for it or wanted it. I had no expectations for our date. I was just pleasantly surprised. It's amazing how there are these cliches that you hear in life and, and you know, the, the, when you're not, one of them is like, when you're not looking for it, that's when things happen. And I think one commonality that both of us had, both of us out of these long-term relationships, uh, neither of us were looking for it. Like my timeline was all right. If I'm splitting from my partner at 34, you know, let me try and 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 be resettled by 40 because I don't want to be 40 and single and no family. And so that gives me you know six years to uh, to grow and 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 find what's what's right. And I think when it comes to this, I love to draw parallels between like different different parts of my life and and one one business saying that that I think is is appropriate here is if it's not a, a fuck yes it's it's a hell no and and when I look at why did this move so fast is it felt like a real fuck yes out of the gates and so that allowed us to to make the moves that we did and and really really accelerate the pace of 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 dating one thing that you said to me was, because we both broke up with our significant others around July. So our timelines are like the exact same, right? And we met each other in November. And you, you went on a lot more dates than I did in that time period, but I went on a couple. And one thing that we both had in common was like, we would go on these dates and be like, okay, they could work. Maybe I'll grow to like them over, the next six months. And so we would keep going on dates with these people. And one thing we had in common when we met each other was like, wait a second. I didn't break up with, get divorced, to go settle for like mediocrity. Is that the right word? Medi mediocrity? Yeah, exactly. Like we, we, the reason we did that, we made that decision was for something like this, which I thought was going to take us, was for this feeling that you and I had, which I thought was going to take me three years if I ever found it. But then what would your response to, to people who would be listening to this and be like, you guys are idiots, it's been six months and you're just in the honeymoon phase? My response to that would be, <laughs> yeah, 
Because cool. we all love the honeymoon phase. <laughs> the honeymoon phase is the best. Um, but the honeymoon phase isn't realistic. And so one thing I look at with you is, okay, you very early on, we were sitting having Aperol spritzes and happy hour and tuna tartare, remember the exact meal. And you looked at me and said, how was your day today? And I said, good, how was your day today? And you said, great, we were like the top seller in Bucky's or something. And like, then you were like, kept moving, you just kept talking. And I was like, that seems like a pretty big deal. And you said, yeah, but the good days are just like the bad days, just another day. And I thought, oh, this guy doesn't live too high or too low, right? You don't get really excited and then you don't get really upset when something goes good or bad. And it, it's an ode to your entrepreneurial spirit, which I think permeates the rest of your life, the way you do things. And then I asked you, okay, if you guys ever sold, like what's the first thing you would buy? And you said, nothing, Alex, my life wouldn't change. I live today how I would live if my bank account was 20X or minus 20X. And there's little things like that, seeing how you are to your friends, how you treat your family, like who you are to your core, which is when shit hits the fan with you and I, that's the person I wanna be with, right? When the honeymoon fades, ends, is the person underneath all that chemistry like a good person that I wanna be with? And the answer to that, I very quickly figured out was yes. And so, honeymoon phase, yeah, we're totally in that. Everyone should be in that the first year. But underneath that, our foundation to me is plenty strong. Let me ask you this. How does it feel though dating a divorcee? Does it feel weird or is your honeymoon phase a little less fun than my honeymoon phase, you think? So I missed the mark on this initially. So when we first met, I thought that we were from apples to apples dating pasts. I had a six-year relationship. You had your, uh, your similar timeline. And, uh, and I think we bonded over a lot of commonalities in that. But over time, what I really learned was how much added trauma comes from divorce, particularly around the societal pressures and judging of, uh, of going through it, and, and that I think you, you spoke to in a really impactful way on, on last week's episode. In terms of the divorce process, how does it feel divorcing someone that comes from generational wealth to now dating a popcorn salesman? <laughs> no, no, it's, I get that question because I opened the can of worms of the divorce and he's like, hold my beer. Let me ask you a question. Um, okay. The financial situation of my marriage was paralyzing for me. I didn't have a lot of clarity around finances and maybe that's my fault. Maybe not. I did try to get clarity, but I was always honestly confused. And as like a really determined person who wants to go out and make my own living and work hard and like that's how I get fulfillment, that was, that really held me back and confused me. So I'll kind of answer it by giving you a compliment. One thing I love about you is you are entirely self-made. You just referenced yourself as a popcorn sales salesman, which is hilarious. That was really self-deprecating of you because you sell a lot of popcorn and a lot of chicken skins because I have a front row seat to the numbers. Um, and that's, it's a good business. But I see, I see the parallel you're asking by it's no, no means generational wealth because it didn't start generations ago. So to answer the question, how does it feel? It feels a lot more empowering the good news for you is I want to make my money. That's what drives me. I learned a lesson really early on in life that money in my bank account won't make me happy. I need to work hard. I need to achieve things. And that's what fulfills me. I have more financial security today than I ever have in the past four or five years. And I have less money today. You know, I think you you painted that picture in an impactful way, but how do you actually quantify it? Right. So my rent was, call it $900, okay? Now it's $500. If anyone has a brain, you can figure out what I'm saying. 
Um, I pay a lot in rent, more than I should in terms of how do you're going to. So you cut your rent in half. I cut my rent in half. But the percent I pay in rent versus what I make. But I knew I had to say, Alex, what's important to you? Where I live is like super important to me. I need my location to be good and I need to have natural light. And so my clothing budget, I used to spend a lot more on clothes. Because guess what I didn't have to think about? Saving money, really. So money in was kind of money out for me. Um, so I used to spend, I don't know what I would spend on clothes. I don't shop nearly as much anymore. Clothing sponsors, hook her up. <laughs> At Alice and Olivia. Uh, I also get a lot more deals now on clothes, but I don't spend... I don't spend as much on clothing anymore because I, I just re-wear a lot of stuff. I don't know. That was a big area that I cut. Travel for me, I'm always going to travel. I like to travel. I like to travel a certain way. So I, I just looked. I couldn't, you know what? I, I couldn't believe I could do it. I couldn't believe that I could make the jump that fast and just say, what's important to you? Go do these brand deals. Because like, I don't take a salary from Just. So I knew I had to make it in brand deals. And I have a little over 200,000 followers on Instagram. I did not know what kind of business that could bring in. And I was scared to death when I started, but my girl, Sarah, just started sending me these brand deals and I was like, oh, oh, I can make this. So I save a portion and I spend a portion. I, I went through through something similar when I left finance, right? And and because you leave finance where, you know, the paychecks are very different than than the entrepreneurial world. And you like put pen to paper on, all right, like what is what is your cost of living today when you're when you have income X and then what is it going to go to and um, and then how am I actually going to make the money and I think what's really empowering is you realize like how much of of the fat around a lofty monthly spend you can cut while staying really happy uh, and then secondarily how like when you you know put your head to it like you can find ways to to pay the bills. Like I remember I was scared shitless leaving leaving finance and like how am I going like how am I actually going to bring dollars in, into the door? Uh, but but when you get back into a corner you can you can really do uh, do some special things. All right, so let me ask you this. What were your preconceived notions of me, I guess, around the finance area? Around around the finance area, it was something that I wanted to get ahead of early because if if you had had normalized living your life a certain way that wasn't aligned with my lifestyle that was that was going to be a deal breaker what I really wanted to avoid is a situation that I see a lot of people you know around me get into where they set the base of spending in their partnerships at unsustainable levels and you know ultimately that isn't a recipe for for success. And so like, I didn't want to, us to live a certain way over the first four, eight, 12 weeks of our relationship. And then, you know, three, four months down the road, I'm like, yeah, we can't keep affording to do that. And you'd be like, well, what, what the fuck? That's the person I, I fell for. So um, I think the way we were living, you know, in the early weeks is still the exact same way we're living today. And I think it's the way that we can live for, um, for, for years ahead. I remember when you asked me, you called, you, ha you, you Ubered me to the first date because you drove by my apartment. But I remember we were talking about it on the date and I was like, would you have called me an Uber otherwise if you weren't driving by my apartment? And you were like, no, Alex, I would never have called you an Uber, called you a car to the first date because there's a lot of guys out there that'll do that. And you can go date one of them, but I am not setting the precedent out of the gates that I'm that guy, that I'm going to spoil you and take care of you. Because if you can't get from point A to point B on date number one, like we I don't know what we're doing here. And I remember thinking, oh, I kind of thought I had this thought in my head before that of like, it's really nice if a guy calls you a car. Okay. No, it's, it is, that is nice. But I loved your perspective of like, I'm not setting that precedent. There's a ton of guys out there that'll do that and you can go date one of them, but I'm not him. 
And yeah, I loved it. And and I only got there because of prior dates I went on where that was expressed to me as, as an expectation of, of what I should I should be doing. And it's like, like I yeah, I'm not I'm not the, I'm not that guy. Uh, and um you and don't yeah. want to be that guy. N- no. And and that you know, for some folks that works and, and for others it, it isn't a priority and I look to be with someone where that isn't a priority. Um what's it like dating a content creator now? Oof. I lived such a private life before you and I loved it. And it was a definite change of pace when, you know, I come home and and see you making content of my house or I go to work and, you know, I show up and there's a situation where a, a colleague of mine is like, so how were your April spritzes last night? And I'm like, what April spritzes? He's like, you know, some April spritzes by the beach. And I'm like, how the hell does this guy know about my date last night? And, you know, it's because you go in and you made a TikTok and you make your TikToks quick and, and do them unnoticeable. And so there was definitely an adjustment period. And, and out of the gates, I really didn't like it. And I think we had a lot of like back and forth, I, I guess, arguments about it. And what I'd gotten really comfortable with is like I'm really proud of, of the life I built and... I don't have anything to hide. And so if that means the camera is now on me uh, a certain amount of, of times in the day, it's something I can deal with, whether or not I think what I'm doing is, is interesting or, or, or not. That's fair. Yeah, I'm on a content ban of him now, except for today we're breaking that content ban. But the rule was I was supposed to get approval because he's like, I have investors, I have employees. Like, if you're going to make a video of me, Alex, just show it to me and let me just say yes or no. And I just couldn't follow that rule. I wanted to, but I would make the video and I'd just pop it up and you'd come home and you'd be like, Alex, run the video by me. And I'd be like, I can change, I'm coachable. Next day, wouldn't think about it, make the video, pop it up. And so I had to learn the hard way, which was no more. I'm not in any of the videos. Yay! <laughs> now you're on the podcast. And do you think this re- like this relationship, how, you, how do you... Th- would you say, what would you say to people who say you're using this relationship for clicks? Uh, I would just say I'm not. <laughs> like, it was the easiest thing in the world to obey the ban. I don't yeah. know. Like, but why? You are having me on here right now. I'm having you on here right now because it's interesting. And this, Just Alex, is a podcast about my life, and you are a big part of my life. But I, I can, I can get those clicks. That's a really non fun way to live. The best way for me to live in terms of content is what makes me happy, what lights me on fire, and I don't care how it does. And you put those things out into the ether, and that's a life you can sustain. So not for clicks, ladies and gentlemen. I also think if you were doing it for clicks, there'd be much better people to date than me. I'm yeah, not a very you're not, clickable character. You're not my click guy. There are people way more clickable than you. What was I going to do? Get divorced and then go out there and optimize my relationship for clicks well thank you you're welcome you're just you and i'm just me and that's the best way to live what um one of one of the things that that surprises me most about the online world is is you know when it comes to you in the real world no one lights up a room like you i've never met anyone who um who has that that level of, of energy and positivity when when you step someone there and, and who is the focal point of, of who everyone wants to talk to. But then you go online and and you received a wild amount of, of negativity. Why do you think that is? And what's your view on it? Um I think listen, a lot of the negativity is the stoolies. When I left Barstool there was always a lot of hate on the Mean Girl page, but whenever I left Barstool, it came over to my personal page. And it's gone now for the most part. But my view on it is like, I always say, I'm glad I'm the one online because I've always had truly thick skin. When I first started creating content, I remember 
I, people were unfollowing me. My number went from 10,000 to like 8,000. And I was like, well, that's the wrong direction. And I downloaded the app of like who that is and I would read them. And they were like some of my good friends in college unfollowing you and that stings. And you need those moments to like fail, to ask yourself like, do I wanna keep going? But if the hate comments affect me, like I need to get offline. And any influencer or content creator that they truly hurt, like don't be online because your life's not worth it if those really do hurt you. But I can compartmentalize those. Like percentage wise, most of my comments are really nice. Comments I leave on people's posts, really nice. Yeah, I'm blown away at your ability to to shrug them off. And it's my, really impressive. And my mom will be like, like she'll call me and be like, do they really not affect you? And it's like, mom, they really don't affect me. And I, since I can take hate comments, I am a lot more likely to take more risks online. Like I'll start this podcast and I don't care what the feedback is. A risk like putting your new relationship on the internet for everyone to go and judge. And I don't need, and, I, and so I'll be, ju- I, I can read those comments and people, somebody asked me last night, is, was Harrison a bottom before you? And it's just like, they're calling you gay. And I just read that. And Before, I, I'm still a bottom. Yeah, I, that's what I, I read that and I think, cool. And if my dad always said this, honey, if you can look in the mirror and know who's looking back at you, you'll be okay. Your father is never short of good sayings. No, he's not. Um, Can't wait to tell that part about when you met my parents. Yeah, it's a really good story. For a later episode. That's <laughs> a really good story. Hi, Kim and Joe. Hi, Mom and Dad. So... Keeping with the trend of online content, your episode last week, first of any of your episodes that I've listened to and watched that I thought it was really good. One of the things that jumped out to me was your vulnerability that you spoke about, about hitting rock bottom at Canyon Ranch. And then, interestingly enough, for my birthday in March, we went to Canyon Ranch. So where you hit your low... Going back there while going through a new chapter of life, how did it feel from your end uh, to, to, to be back? Well, <laughs> while it was selfish of me to take you to Canyon Ranch for your birthday, I do want to say I gave him five options and you said, let's go where you're going to love. And I just love it there. But yeah, I hit, I hit rock bottom there and Canyon Ranch is a special place in my heart. But I think the answer to this is actually larger. Like when you met me and I met you, I was in a place where I was shelled off from everybody. And I had this like hard armor on of if I'm going to, if I'm going to make it in life, it's going to be because I did it and I don't need anybody. That's the headspace I was in. And when I met you, I had to drop that armor because if I didn't let you in, I was going to push you away. And in order to do that, I had to really soften. And there was a lot of things in life. You meeting my parents, going to Canyon Ranch, taking somebody home to Oklahoma, which I just did for Easter, that I found daunting and really painful, like an open wound that wasn't closed yet and it was st- still really hurt. But whenever I met you, you gave me the strength to say, I can take him to meet my parents because I like this guy so much and I feel so much towards him that you gave me the, the tools and like the power to face the really hard parts of my life and Canyon Ranch is one of those. So while I hit rock bottom there, the best way to heal your past is to feel your past. So home for me was the place where my ex and I spent holidays and I thought, oh, I can never take somebody back there. You, it was, I wanted to take you back there because it's healing for me, but it's also a way of moving forward. So Canyon Ranch is just an example of that. And I was really excited to take you there because my past is, you told me this, my past is a really important part of who I am today. And your past is too, and it shapes us. And so bringing you into that in a way that's respectful, I want to do. I never thought I would want to do it, but you give me the security to do it and to face it. So thank you for that. You, you just, man, you just make me, you force me to be, I hate the word authentic. I think it's a buzzword, 
but you forced me to be my purest version of myself. On date number three, I, you guys, I remember Harrison brought, we had been going out to dinners and he was like, I'm going to bring over something fun. So we ordered pancakes for dinner because I love breakfast for dinner. And he brought board games. We played Connect Four all night. And for the first hour, I was just talking to him and kind of being a hostess. And then I remember he said, hey, when are you going to be the real Alex? And I was like, I'm being the real Alex. This is me. And you were like, no, you're not. You're being PR Alex, he called it. And he was like, it's all right. You don't have to put on this front for me and be so politically correct and energized. You can just be yourself. And ever since then, he's quick to call me on. Like, that was a PR answer. And so he constantly forces me to really be me. And I, I really love that about you. So thank you. Of course. Let's, on that note, we're going to wrap her on up. You guys, we're going to, I had a giveaway last week and we're going to have a giveaway this week that Harrison's going to pick out the items for. He's got on his Naked Market Bass Pro Shop hat and they don't sell those online, but everyone's always like, where did he get that? And so he's going to give one of those away and then I don't know what else you're going to pick for the giveaway, but it'll be cool. Some good. We're going to leave here and we're going to pick it. So we'll put that together. Look out for the giveaway online. And next week, I'm going to do a Q&A because we've got two episodes under our belt. You guys have follow-up questions. I'm going to put up a, a text box on Instagram and say, ask me questions. And then I will sit in here and I will answer them all honestly with no PR, Alex. So look out for that. Um, okay, I always, I always wrap it by saying I love you guys. So love you guys. Say it to them. Tell them. Love you guys. Come do you on. want to tell the story of the first time you told me you love me? Five days in, I'd said it as a joke, but I wasn't kidding. Say I love you guys to them. Thank you, everyone, for listening. That was nice. Okay, guys, thanks for listening to another episode of Just Alex, powered by Just Media House. If you enjoyed the show, which I think you did because you made it this far, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, rate, and review. All of those things are so important. Stay connected on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook at Just Alex Pod. Post-production by Creative Evolution Studios. Theme song to the Just Alex pod by Gideon Shockin and Denisha. I'm Just Alex. You're just you. Let's keep doing this thing. New episodes every Thursday. Thursday.